The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. This week on Q&A, New York Times Magazine correspondent and author Mark Leibovich discusses his new book titled, This Town, Two Parties and a Funeral, Plus Plenty of Valet Parking in America's Gilded Capital. Mark Leibovich, author of This Town, I want to show you some video and get you to comment on it. Andrea and Alan uh, charted a couple of buses to take a guest to their wedding in uh, Virginia. Come to think of it, I can't remember the last time that I heard the words Henry Kissinger and Greyhound bus in the same sentence. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless, um, apparently there was also some confusion that day. Another wedding guest, my good friend and colleague, Pat Moynihan, wandered onto the uh, wrong bus that day and ended up at a Promise Keepers rally in Arlington, Virginia, uh, <laughs> you may recall. But the marriage is obviously going very, very well indeed. Spina Bifida Roast, 1997. Spina Bifida Roast for the Al Hunt, Judy Woodruff child. Yeah. What did you see in that clip that you might comment on? Nothing. I mean, look, it's, it's what, it's Andrea Mitchell, who is a terrific journalist, and you can't emphasize that enough, and she's being roasted by Chris Dodd. I mean, it looked, I mean, just seeing that right now, it just looked like a kind of a very friendly, almost clubby Washington event. Uh, jokes are told. There looked like a lot of comedy. And that's what I saw. Anything wrong with that? No, not really. I mean, it was, they were talking, I think the reference he was making was to Andrea Mitchell and, um, and uh, Alan Greenspan's wedding, which I guess had just been held around then. And look, I mean, it's a, they're a power couple. I mean, Andrea Mitchell is, is a great journalist, and Alan Greenspan's one of the most powerful economic minds and economic forces in the last few decades. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting dynamic where you have these crossover between friendship and professional life and social life and so forth. But you write in there, for instance, Chris Dodd, who was a senator then, now works for the Motion Picture Association, told you that he'd never lobby. He did. He told other people he wouldn't lobby, and now he's head of one of the most powerful lobbying organizations in Washington. And I think what Chris Dodd is emblematic of in this book is sort of this permanent feudal class, um, which is a term that Tom Coburn, a senator from Oklahoma, uses it's to sort of describe the permanence of Washington, the fact that people come here, they almost always stay now. A lot of elected officials go on to become lobbyists and consultants, and frankly, life is very, very good inside the Beltway. Here's some of the exposure you've had already over the first couple of weeks of your published book. Let's watch this. This town. Wow, Mark. Mark Leibovich. This town. <laughs> this town. You said uh, we described uh, D.C. as overfed on self-love, inflated by big media and driven by big money. <laughs> Senator Schumer, a bombastic Jew, Lynn's happy even by senatorial standards, and Tammy Haddad, a human ladle in the local self-celebration buffet. Wow, Mark. All kinds of reaction to this town, a Washington takedown, Mark Leavich and the preening egos of this town. Hypocrisy, thy name is duh, Washington, the Wall Street Journal, the Rolling Swamp of Washington. <laughs> I, hear there's, I, I hear there's no index, so we can't find out what's actually going on, that people are up and arms <laughs> about. No, I, I, this book was so widely anticipated in Washington, there's going to be this damning, excoriating indictment of Washington. Washington Post uh, created a bootleg index of the uh, thing. So I'm friends with everybody in this book. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I used to be. And here's one of the things that uh, Mike, Mark writes. He says, Politico, particularly your colleague Mike Allen, is prone to trafficking suggestive notions in the spirit of, quote, driving the conversation. I think that was sort of a, a wet fettuccine slap as opposed, to a, <laughs> as opposed to a punch. Everybody's talking about the book because everybody thinks they're in it or is afraid that they're in it. Why are people that you wrote about so happy about this book? Beats me. I mean, I think what, what's interesting is a lot of what you were seeing there uh, was done before anyone had actually seen the book. I mean, there was a, this, the speculation around this sort of took on a life of its own. And look, I mean, it, it's, it's nice to have a book that people are talking about. And, and obviously what happens is people focus on who's up, who's down, who, who looks worse, what, what news is broken, what nuggets are out there. But Ultimately, I think, they're, they're, I mean, I don't want people to miss the more serious point, which is that Washington is, in fact, doing very, very well and in a very, very gilded age um, in some ways, while the rest of the country has, has suffered. 
any reaction to what kind of reaction you've had to the book? Are you surprised about any of it? Not really. I mean, look, when, when you write a book, I mean, a lot can go wrong. I mean, that's just sort of the way I approach the world. I, I have, I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat neurotic in my writing and reporting, and a lot can go wrong in 110,000 words. Um, I've been pretty shocked by, I, I guess, if there's been criticism from inside, it's been mostly in the vein of how dare he, meaning how dare an insider give away the secret handshake? How dare an insider talk about other insiders in a way that perhaps might not be, you know, in keeping with the codes that we have in Washington? And um, you know, people keep asking me, why are people uncomfortable here? And, and, I, and I welcome the discomfort, but I also think this is journalism. I mean, this is what we do, and we should invite discomfort. You write about a man named Ken Duberstein in the book. Here's uh, a little bit of what he looks like and sounds like. Ronald Reagan was very collegial. He delegated. He was a bold stroke leader. He was primary colors, not pastels. He was very comfortable in focusing on the three or four things that he ran on in 1980 that he knew he wanted to achieve as president. He was very comfortable inside his own skin. And he hired people like Jim Baker or Howard Baker and me and others to get everything else done and also assist him on rebuilding our national security, cutting down on wasteful spending, cutting taxes, making sure that regulations didn't get out of control, and fundamentally ending the Cold War. Why was he a subject in your book? Well, Ken, I, I sort of posited as emblematic of a former. Uh, a former is a class of people here who has an office. I mean, he was the White House, Chief of, White House Chief of Staff at the end of the Reagan years, maybe about six months at the end. And he is now, for the last 25 years, been a former White House Chief of Staff, which is legitimate. That's what he did. And he has sort of continued that identity as a lobbyist, and he's been a very, very coveted consultant and wise man. And um, he talks about Reagan a lot. So I sort of, look, he's done very, very well for himself as a former. I mean, obviously, he had a distinguished career in government also. But I, I did sort of posit him as emblematic of someone who is set for life after having its ticket punched um, at the highest levels of the White House. Well, and you actually said he was six and a half months as the yeah. chief of staff, but has been dining out on it for 20 some years. Yeah, it's true. And is that wrong? It's not wrong, it just is. It's how Washington works. It's, I mean, you, what's interesting about Washington in this age is that once you have that title, even if it's a very, very short title, even if you've been voted out after one term, you can stay in Washington and be a former chief of staff, a former congressman, a former chief of staff to congressman X or Y. And that itself is marketable. You are in the club. And that's a stri striking departure from the days in which people would come to Washington to serve, serve a little bit, and then go back to the farm. I mean, which is as, as I guess how the founders had, had intended it. So there's a new dynamic now, and a lot of it starts with money and the money available and the resources available for people to do very well here. Robert Barnett is who? Bob Barnett is a super lawyer. Um, I guess, I don't know if you have to go to a special law school to become a super lawyer, but no, he is a, he's an attorney. He represents Republican presidents, Democratic presidents, the Clintons, Sarah Palin, Cheney's, and what he does is he helps people get big book deals, TV shows, I mean, former senators, former lobbyists, current lobbyists. He's really sort of a fixer, um, and he has sort of cornered the market on helping people in broadcast media, people in the White House, people all over um, sort of cash in on their post-government lives or their post-public lives to sort of enhance their brands. Back in 2002, he did an interview with us. Here's what uh, Robert Barnett looks like. And we also have a strong business department, which does deals and acquisitions and structuring. And then we have uh, things like I do, uh, publishing, and we have, I represent also, I think you know, about 350 television news correspondents and their contracts. I also, in addition to representing the ex-politicians who come out, I represent a lot of major corporate executives. I get a lot of civil litigation, a lot of government relations things, media relations things, criminal investigations. Uh, it's a 
my own practice is broad and the firm is, is generally described like that. You know, he works by the hour. In other words, if you hire him, you pay him lots of money by the hour right. instead of a cut of your book. Did you ever think right. about going to him for your, for your agent? <laughs> um, no, because, I mean, I think, you know, for a lot of reasons I didn't. Um, one, I couldn't write about him if I did. But, but ultimately, I mean, I think Bob has been very, very successful in being able to go to people who are going to get $10 million book deals or $1 million book deals because when you look at the hourly rate, that's going to come to a lot less than the 15%, which is what an agent or a standard literary agent's fee. So, yeah, no, I, I, um, no, I didn't think about going to him, and I don't think I'm going to be going to him in the future. How long did it take you to think up the first sentence of your book, which is, Tim Russert is dead? Um, truthfully, I wrote up the, the scene. The first scene of the book is Tim Russert's funeral, which is this state funeral-like event um, after this giant of a newsman died in 2008. Um, and essentially, the scene is, is this mourning, but also it was a very public mourning. It was at the Kennedy Center of the Performing Arts. And there was a lot of um, networking going on. There was a lot of congratulating going on. People were working it. And I thought that that was sort of a quintessential Washington scene at a quintessential Washington moment. Uh, truthfully, one of my editors at the Washington, at the, in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times, Dick Stevenson, uh, at the time read it and said, hey, this is a good first line. You should use this. And he just sort of suggested I tack it on. And I thought about it. I was worried a little, it was a little crass at first. Um, but um, it worked. So, yeah, I give full credit to Dick. One of the guys that you write a lot about in the book is Tom Brokaw. Here's Tom Brokaw, Brian Williams, and Bruce Springsteen from that funeral. Our friend Timothy J. Russert was a man who awoke every morning as if he had just won the lottery the day before. He was determined to take full advantage of this good fortune that he couldn't quite believe and share it with everyone around him. We were all experts, after all, on Tim's heart. We were all recipients of its might, the generosity and compassion that flowed from it. I felt qualified to conduct a guided tour of Tim's heart. All of us did. And as I scanned the front row, I got to the left side of the stage, and there was a guy in a crisp white shirt and a tie. And I looked, and it was Tim. He had on that big... Irish smile that uh, hit absolutely nothing, <laughs> and it was beaming like the rising sun. <laughs> Tell us more why Tim Russert, you, who you call the mayor of the city, uh, got your attention to start the book. Well, the mayor of official Washington. I mean, I think the reason Tim Tim's death got my attention was, I mean, first of all, the spectacle around it, which was awesome. I mean, it was compared to state funerals. Um, I mean, literally, like to Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan's, um, the, the, the aftermath of their deaths. But no, Tim Russert was, he was the, he was the center. I mean, he, he basically lived at the nexus of media, politics, money, and you needed Tim Russert. And when he died in June of 2008, I sort of saw it as an inflection point, sort of in media, um, in politics, in the country a little bit. I mean, it was the dawn of this epic, in a general election campaign, which resulted in Barack Obama getting elected. The economy was about to crash. Um, Twitter, things like, you know, the internet was really, it was really the first campaign that was fully acted out in the online, in the cyberspace. And Politico was this new force that was just really gaining traction in that election. And in a sense, Tim Russert's death left a vacuum um, in, in this space, which there's this real anarchy in the peanut gallery with, with new media coming in. The country was uncertain, and in a sense, um, the center really hasn't been replaced since Tim died. And, and I thought, you know, for a lot of reasons I go into in the book, I mean, Tim was a consummate Washington uh, figure um, and also a consummate American figure. How could one man, though, be that important in a city with all these stars? Well, I mean, first of all, Meet the Press as a franchise was certainly when he was there, it was the place where politicians really had to go to prove their mettle. I mean, it was interesting. I mean you had someone like Sarah Palin sort of bursting onto the scene a few months after Tim's death, and you sort of wonder, if Tim were still there, would, would they have let her anywhere near him? And you sort of wonder, what would happen? I mean, I guess Tim was the one unquestioned authority of Sunday morning, but also you needed to prove your mettle there. I don't think anyone there, anyone has come along since. You write about his son, 
Why? Well, Luke Russert is is interesting. He's sort of a prince, um, and he got a job. I mean, with NBC very very soon after. He gave an incredibly moving eulogy um, at his father's funeral. I mean, days after his his best friend was taken away from him. And Luke, um, it's funny. I mean, a lot of people sort of cast aspersions on him. I mean, nepotism gets thrown around a lot, and it's obviously quite obvious if his name were Luke Smith, he wouldn't have gotten that job. But um, ultimately. No, I mean, Washington takes care of its own, but, but Luke Russert has also had an interesting few years, and I actually spent a fair amount of time talking to him, and I've been impressed with how he's handled himself and, and really sort of come through a lot of the criticism he's gotten, and he seems like he's, he's you know, doing okay. I'm going to show you what you say was a magic moment for Luke Russert. He had earlier given a eulogy at his father's funeral in a church over in Georgetown. Right. This is from the Kennedy Center, just a brief excerpt. Right. Earlier today... I delivered my father's eulogy, and I'd like to share a few excerpts. I'm sorry to break the news to every charity group and university and, and club that he spoke to, but he kind of had the same speech for all of you. He would just tinker it a little bit, <laughs> depending on who exactly he was talking to. So uh, I would like to do the same thing from what I said earlier. <laughs> And that's, uh, that's what I would do. Kennedy Center, but you, as you observed this funeral, you saw a lot of things that you didn't, either you didn't like or that you thought were worthy of your commenting on or... Yeah, I mean, a lot of what I, I saw was actually in the aisles beforehand and, and afterwards. I mean, it, it was, it had very much the feel of a cocktail party. And, and actually, there literally was a cocktail party up on the roof of the Kennedy Center afterwards. I mean, I thought the speaking program, I mean, some of the speeches I thought were very good, um, but Look, it was also somewhat of a, of a public spectacle. I mean, it was something of a branding opportunity for NBC. I think there was some, definitely some, definitely some difference of opinion on how that should proceed within, you know, the family within NBC. But but ultimately, no, I was struck by the spectacle that it had become. I think, as I say in the book, I mean, Tim Russert would have known better than anyone that it was not so much about him. It was about who was going to fill his void. And Tom Brokaw had a great line, in which he said. I want to welcome friends, family, and the biggest group of all, those who think they will replace Tim on Meet the Press. And uh, I thought that was a very knowing line. And I thought Luke's line right there was very knowing because, in, in a sense, I mean, he was kidding, obviously, but I think the notion of telling the same stories over and over again and just sort of tweaking it for your audience, I mean, Tim Russert, like a lot of people in the media, did a lot of paid speeches or a lot of, um, I mean, he had a brand outside of of his own space. And like politicians, I mean, that's what happens. People tell the same stories and it becomes part of your imprint. You've gotten some reviews. Um, you've gotten, would you say overall that though the, the industry's given you a lot of publicity? Um, I, I guess, I really don't have anything to compare it to. Is there anybody that won't talk about this book? Um, you mean like what media? I mean, entities? you first went on ABC on yeah. a Sunday morning. Yeah, I thought uh, Meet the Press would have been a little awkward. Because you said some strong things about David Gregory? I, I guess. I mean, I, it, a lot of it was, yeah, I, I mean, I, I suppose. I mean, he was not a big player in the book. Um, there were certainly some lines that could have been construed as, as unfriendly. And, and uh, anybody else say that we just should not talk about this? Book? Probably. I mean, I don't know what's going on in private, but it's been, I mean, it's been pr easier than I thought. I mean, I was on, I've been on MSNBC a number of times, um, like in the last couple of days. So, no, I, I'm sure there is some awkwardness. I'm sure there are some, some meetings that I'm not privy to in which, you know, we're going to keep him off. But, no, I mean, look, people are, seem fascinated by it. I mean, I think the reviews, I mean, I'm sure you'll read some, some bad ones here, but I think they've been overwhelmingly great. I mean, just sort of as a piece of writing and and so i've been gratified why would you expect me to read a bad review uh, you know because you're brian and, and we love you for it so. <laughs> sure yeah. anyway this is a review from amazon and it's mm -hmm. just a person it's sure. called ronald k 204 mm -hmm. uh and there weren't frankly there weren't that many negative but i want to read this just to get your reaction sure. to it this author you is going to profit from gently exposing a despicable culture that he should be much more angry about let me just stop there. Yeah, Th that's emblematic of a kind of criticism I've gotten. Um, I mean, there have been w what's been, I think, striking to me is that a lot of people have thought, you know, he's a little bit too mean in places, he's a little too incisive. Then there's a school of thought like 
like that commenter, which is that I went easy on them because I'm an insider and because, you know, I'm taking care of my friends. I mean, first of all, the profiting, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to, I don't, I don't, I mean, knock wood, but that's not what was the motivation here. But ultimately, yeah, I mean, there are people on both sides who say I, I went easy and those who said I, I went, I didn't go easy enough. So, I mean, I don't really know what to say except that I, I guess that might be a balancing meter. Let me read some more. Most Americans, including the president, hold Congress in low esteem. This is Ronald K. 204, whoever he is. These characters are the scavengers and sycophants at the periphery who become rich and sort of famous just by hanging around. Leibovich attacks the most vulnerable transitional figures to achieve credibility without jeopardizing his access. In fact, this book will make him an important figure to reckon with. He will become, for a time, one of those people he is writing about. Um, yeah, I don't quite know what that means. I mean, I guess, I mean, first of all, I mean, the overwhelming number of, of subjects in the book are, are well known and, and quite powerful on their own merits. I mean, most of them are, many of them are elected officials or former elected officials. Um, look, I, I can't control how people will perceive me afterwards. Other characters in the book, we have some more video to show them. And one of them is, and this is not a character, this is somebody that you wrote seriously about, uh, a man named Michael Hastings. Mm -hmm. uh, who died recently, here's a clip. Any of the people who fought in these wars who I've spoken to and who've reached out to me, uh, they've never criticized, criticized my reporting. In fact, a lot of them have said to me, and this is self-serving for me to say, but I'll say it anyway, a lot of them have said to me, you know, you, this, is, this is what it's really like. Um, and that to me is the greatest compliment. If the brass is upset, and if these think tankers in Washington are upset, then I feel like I've probably done my job. He died in a crash. He was driving at 4 o'clock in the morning in Los Angeles and the, the fire and all that. He's 35 years old. He wrote mm -hmm. a book about Stanley McChrystal, Stanley McChrystal, the general in Afghanistan, had to leave the service. Why did you write about him? Well, I mean, first of all, it was written, obviously, well before he died. And I don't, I met him twice. I mean, I never knew him. But ultimately, Michael Hastings wrote what I think was arguably the most consequential story of, of President Obama's first term, which was he, he wrote for Rolling Stone a profile of Stanley McChrystal, in which the general and people around him spoke out of school. Michael quoted, you know, from some of those conversations. I guess there's a gray area and some disagreement on whether ground rules were violated. But ultimately, McChrystal wound up getting fired for those remarks. And there was quite a backlash against Hastings. I mean, I, again, I wasn't there. I don't know what ground rules, you know, were or were not violated. But ultimately, he was sort of cast out. I mean, there was a how, again, there was a how dare you sort of um, outcry against him from a lot of uh, established journalists. And I thought, as I say in the book, it did have a circling the wagons category because, you know, in fact, Michael Hastings is an outsider. He's not a part of any club. And he broke a big story. And I think it's, it's noteworthy that I mean, people like Woodward and Bernstein, when they broke Watergate, were outsiders. Um, I, I think quite often you need to sort of be outside of those unwritten rules in that club in order to maybe see it freshly or, or sort of not abide by things you don't know about. Lara Logan of CBS News, who had uh, coverage of her own over in Afghanistan yeah. and Iraq, criticized Michael uh, Hastings to you or to somebody else? No, that was in an interview, I think, with Howie Kurtz on CNN, yeah. but a number of people did. I and mean, what was her point? I, I think her point was and I, I think if I'm quoting from the interview, she said, something doesn't add up here. Usually if, if people in the field, if, if the brass trust you and they feel you've treated them fairly, you'll be invited back. And look, I mean, needless to say, Michael Hastings, I don't think would be invited back into a setting like that. But again, what I thought that was a window into is, uh, again, the unwritten codes of access journalism and being it, 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 the importance of being inside, for lack of a better term, the team. Um, and, and obviously journalists and the principals have very, very different functions. But I don't think Michael Hastings was worried about the next story. I mean, I think if you are a beat reporter, whether it's in a campaign or, or in the field somewhere, you are going to be thinking about an ongoing relationship. And I think Michael Hastings might have had an advantage that way. So, no, I mean, Laura Logan was extremely critical. I mean, John Burns, my colleagues at the Times, uh, very critical. I mean, a lot of people were. And in fairness, I wasn't there. I mean, I don't, I was not, I've not, never been a, a war reporter or a uh, battlefield reporter.
Well, given the kind of book you've written here about a lot of people, but right. you, you know, most of them you've seen in, in public sure. events, mm -hmm. is Michael Hastings good or bad? That whole idea of getting inside and then blowing the lid off. I think it's, um, well, look, without knowing the particulars, I, and I think he's good. I mean, I think he wrote the truth as he knew it, as he knew it. He fact-checked it. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to litigate the, whatever disagreements they might have had over ground rules, but look, I mean, they spoke truthfully. I, I thought I was struck at that point that the coverage around McChrystal's comments were, why would he let him in? That was bad public relations on his part, poor handling. It was, it was striking. It was sort of written as a process mistake rather than a, a mistake of over candor. What, when you went about reporting for this, how did you, did you carry a notebook? Did you carry a, a, a recorder? How did you keep track of what people said? So some combination of both. I mean, a lot of it was done in the course of reporting, you know, for the New York Times and before that, the Washington Post. So, I mean, there, there was a travelogue component to some of it. But no, I mean, I interviewed probably, you know, a few hundred people. Um, a lot of the interviews were taped. I mean, sometimes if I was at an event, I would take notes afterwards. I mean, it, it's a real hybrid of of um, different forms. When did you start? When did you know you had a book? <laughs> so when it was done. Um, well, but I mean, you know yeah. what I mean. When, did, when was the first mention that, that, hey, you got a book here? The, the, the book, actually, I officially, I guess, did the deal to write the book in, I think it would have been April or May of 2010. And it was right after a uh, New York Times Magazine piece I did on Mike Allen, who is a, is a very, very widely read and very influential columnist for Politico. He writes this email every morning called Playbook. And that seemed to get the attention of, of some people who wondered, you know, is that how Washington really works today? Is that how it looks? Is that what, you know, today's news cycle, today's um, sort of ecology of Washington looks like? And, it, you know, some people had an idea of fleshing it into a larger picture. As you know, you pointed out in the article in the New York Times originally and then in this book that no one knows where Mike Allen lives and everybody, and you even tell a story in here about a friend taking him home. He said, let me off here. He got out of the of the friend's car and he hailed a taxi so that right. he could go home. What's that all about? I don't know. I mean, Mike Allen is a, an eccentric figure. He's, again, he's a very, very prominent journalist here. I mean, he's extremely private. And that was an awkward story. It was one of the hardest stories I've ever done because I, mean, I worked with Mike Allen at the Washington Post for many years. I've known him for years. And um, so in some degrees, I mean, it was a meta-journalism exercise. but. We, it, it was, a, it was, I mean, Mike is, is a character and, but, but beyond being a character and being very private, he is also an extremely successful, prominent, influential journalist. And I wanted to try to reflect that both someone who has made Washington work for him in this age, but also someone who really does drive the way people talk about and cover news around here. I was struck though as I was reading, I thought, you know, another person that we don't know much about that drives the discussion is a guy named Matt Drudge. Mm -hmm. um, why did you not, why, I mean, in other words, it, are these the only people that matter that are in this book or are they just people you picked? Oh, no, they're just people I picked. I mean, I, I only had, um, yeah, I only had what, I, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't be comprehensive. I mean, you have to sort of pick people who you think are, are typical and sort of make a broader point. I mean, Matt Drudge, Obviously, a very, very powerful, um, you know, website or Drudge, the Drudge Report's a very powerful website. I, I, I guess I didn't write about him. I mean, first of all, it's been around since the late '90s. Um, I think it's pretty well established. I mean, I think Politico might have suffered here a little bit because one, it's new. I mean, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times have been around for a long, long and time. And Mike Allen works for Politico. Mike Allen works for Politico. Let's so. take a look. At, for those who might not know who he is, we've got some video of him. Uh, Craig Cam is when we go deep into the newsroom. Craig is our editor. He controls the coverage. Uh, hopefully Mikey's with him and he can let us know how we're processing this and uh, what different themes that we're looking for and planning on writing about for tomorrow morning. Yeah, well, uh, Jim, Craig Cam and Mikey Cam have merged into one uh, super cam tonight. Uh, uh, Craig Gordon, uh, the last few nights have been a lot of drama, surprises. Tonight, we think we know what's going to happen, right? The big drama is whether my save this tape prediction of a single digit win for Mitt Romney is right, or the network X of polls of a dub double digit lead is right. So how does it affect the coverage that we think we know where this movie's headed? You know, it, it struck me that Mike Allen's all over town. We see him all the time. We see him on this network. 
Uh, Matt Drudge hides down in Miami. I'm sure he yeah. doesn't like to hear that hides, but he, he hasn't <laughs> been around for four or five years. Right. So does it pay off for Mike Allen that he's here versus not being here? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, look, Mike is Mike is shoe leather. I mean, Mike is everywhere, like you said. I mean, he, I mean, you will get emails from him at all hours. He is. He seems to be. I mean, you look up, and all of a sudden, he's on C-SPAN. He's on SMEC. He's on the Mikey Cam on uh, whatever that was. So, no, I mean, no. Mike is an insider. I think I don't think he would pretend otherwise. And, and, and if you live here and you get his playbook, what's it look like every day? It's an email that comes anywhere from maybe. Five o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the morning. It's an email. It goes maybe you know, a few thousand words, and it's sort of a synopsis of news that might have broken overnight. Uh, what Mike has decided is the the things that will drive the conversation that day, to use their terminology. And um, you know, there are a lot of birthday shout-outs. Um, sometimes there there's some personal commentary. I mean, it's a hodgepodge that, for I mean, I guess speaking from my own experience, is something that keeps people coming back and and more importantly I mean it TV bookers read it religiously editors read it religiously it seems politicians read it religiously so it is a probably an outsized vehicle in, in getting people to sort of in sort of setting an agenda in the given day we'll get to Trent lot later but I wrote down in the book you say naturally lot says he hates Washington <laughs> What's the hate Washington thing? Everyone claims to hate Washington, it seems. There are very few Washington exceptionalists out there who will say, I love it here. It's just, I mean, there are some, but no, Trent Lott, I th would like people to think that he would prefer to be home in, in Mississippi or, or wherever else, um, but he's here because, as, as he said, this is where the problems are and this is where the money is. And uh, Trent Lott, as a former senator, is, is in a position to do very, very, very well here. And, uh, probably the only other place where he could do proportionately well would be somewhere in Mississippi, and I guess he chooses to be here. In that clip we showed of, of Mike Allen, and, uh, it was Jim Van High, whose job is? He's the executive editor, I think, of Politico. And you quote him in here. I assume this quote came directly to you from him. I'll, I'll read it. it. Yeah. Jim Van High, who is 42, is contemptuous of Washington's it used to be better right. reflex as he relates to news. Mm -hmm. Quote, those institutions and reporters, he says, referring to traditional ones, were never as good as their reputations. And they limited, in consequential ways, the information flowing to people who cared about politics. It was largely, and this was true for decades, a small group of middle-aged, left-of-center, overweight men who decided how all of us should see politics and governance. What is he saying there? I mean, are we old-timers worthless? <laughs> um, look, I mean, Jim, I think, is putting forth a view that the age in which the 12 boys on the bus or the 20 boys on the bus are setting the agenda um, in their one story they write or file a day are over. And I think one of the missions of Politico is to sort of democratize the conversation in a way. And, and you know, 100,000 people can read Mike Allen every day and anyone can tweet about it and anyone can blog about it. So, I mean, I think what what Jim was saying there is that there is this wild west. There is this notion that the conversation has been broken open. And I mean, I wouldn't be as disparaging, especially of, of the, the body types of, of my forebears in the journalism world. But um, he, uh, I mean, so I think that he was probably just trying to draw a sharp contrast. Well, is there, was there such a group around here, a small group of middle-aged, I don't know what middle age is, he's 42, <laughs> right. left of center, overweight men who decided how all of us should see politics and governance. You came here 16 years ago? Yeah, Washington? 1997. Yeah. How long did you spend at the Washington Post? Nine years. And how long have you been at the New York Times? Seven years. So a lot of those old timers, like, oh, I'm afraid to mention them, they, right. they put them in that category, who are long gone, the Novaks and right. the Jack Germans and all. Is that what he's talking about? Presumably. I mean, I think, I mean, he seemed to be talking about sort of the boys on the bus um, iconic, icon, let's say caricature. The boys on the bus caricature. I mean, the the German, the wood covers, uh, Johnny Apples, and and he, um, yeah. I mean, I think in some ways it's a straw man because I mean, Jim didn't work with these people. I didn't work with these people. I mean, I I think the, the way in which it used to be is sort of often sort of thrown out there as a sacred cow when in fact nostalgia or or even vilification for it is is a little bit extreme on both ends. 
Margaret Carlson, who's been in Washington for years, wrote a review of your book. Have you seen it? Um, everyone tells me not to read reviews. So uh, since I have not followed that advice at all, yes, I've seen it. The, the thing I wanted to bring up in there, she says, even though you're tough on the, the club, mm -hmm. and by the way, define the club. I would say the club is the sort of free-floating cast of, of elected officials, former elected officials, staffers, lobbyists, journalists, uh, hangers-on that just sort of constitutes what we call official Washington or insider Washington. And are you in the club? Yes. She says, though, although you're tough on the club and all that, you're a man with a heart. I would agree with that. I, I, well, I haven't seen that before in all these reviews. You haven't seen my heart? <clears throat> no. I haven't seen the reference to your heart. What, what did you think? And they <clears throat> talked about you lost a brother years ago. And I did. When was that? Uh, my younger brother, Phil, who was three years younger than me, uh, he was in a car accident when he was 17. I was 20, and I was, uh, I was a junior in college. And uh, he was a passenger, and his best friend was driving. A uh, speeding tow truck was going to the scene of an accident and um, hit the car, and, and Phil was in a coma for, for five, six years and uh, eventually died when he was 23. And I was, I was living in Boston at the time, and one of the reasons I, I went back to Boston, I went to the University of Michigan, was so I could um, just be with him and, and spend time with him uh, after, after work and, and so forth. So yeah, no, that was a defining and awful time in my life. What impact did it have on you? <clears throat> I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I mean, I, I guess sort of the pop psychological psychological analysis is that I um, maybe I I sort of am trying to succeed for two or something like that, or I sort of carry him with me. I mean, the the truth is, I don't know. I just I just miss him. I mean, I miss him a lot. I I think about what it would be like to have him as as a great friend in adulthood. And my sister and I, uh, she's six years younger than me, are are very close. And um, you know, it's just that empty space that's always going to be there and, you know, the lost potential and, and everything. So it's mostly, um, without sort of putting it into any grand construction, I mean, it's just mostly sadness. Well, you tell us in the book, though, your sister Lori works at the Huffington Post. She does. Why yes. did you do that? Why did you tell us that? Well, I think when I started writing a little bit about Ariana Huffington, I thought it was important to disclose immediately that uh, Lori worked um, not just for her, but in a very, very close adjacent office. and. Uh, so it might get a little awkward. So I said that parenthetically. Anybody get mad at you enough to communicate to you about the book? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, any Give emails. us an example of. Um, <laughs> nothing I would say significant. I mean, I think um, maybe I wish you had considered that. I mean, th there were some how dare you's. I mean, let, let's just sort of put it in a broad category. Um, I've been in this town for 50 years, and you focused on this and that. And I'm being, I think, deliberately vague here because I don't want to violate private conversations. But there just haven't been many. Um, I, I'm sure there will be recriminations. I'm sure there's a lot of chatter about, you know, this and and what I have done. But nothing of of note. I mean, no. I mean, I sort of was surprised because I it's been out in the bloodstream for a couple of weeks now, and um, the response, at least from the the aggrieved parties has been pretty muted. But given the way you talk about this town, in the end, doesn't everybody who appears in your book really benefit? In the way the town, based on that way sure. you say the town operates. Everybody talked about this book. I've got the index here from the Washington Post. There's right. 739 right. names in there. Yeah. Uh, people rushed to the Post to see it because you didn't put an index in here. Right. right. Um, there's a school of thought that says, yes, everyone will benefit. And it's actually, it's, it's interesting. Um, a number of people have, I think, mock complained, but they say, how could I not be in there? And I saw um, a tweet from Lanny Davis, for instance. <laughs> Lanny Davis. I didn't make the cut, but you didn't make the cut. In Mark Leibovich from yeah. my book. Yeah. Lanny Davis is a classic Washington character who was not mentioned once in my book, but who managed to be mentioned in, in a lot of the coverage about the book. I mean, Lanny is um, he's a former lawyer. He's a lawyer. He was in the Clinton administration. Um, he's now kind of a crisis PR guy. And he is very, very vigorous and successful in getting attention for himself. And, and he, uh, yes, so he, he complained, mock complained about not being in there, but then thanked me. And then all of a sudden I tweeted about it. And then all of a sudden people were talking about Lanny Davis, even though he wasn't in the book. I so. just, my thumb went to this uh, quote in your book. Uh, it was at a buffet table. Uh, Chris Matthews, who was mad about a profile I'd written about him earlier in the year, Matthews blamed that story, he said, for costing me a job that I really wanted. Uh, 
Chris Matthews is known as somebody who will tell people exactly what he thinks. He is. Yeah. Did he tell you off? Uh, he, you know, Chris, <laughs> Chris and I had sort of a, um, I don't know, I mean, I wrote a profile of Chris and I think it was the spring of 2008. And uh, I, I think most people who know him say that it, it captured Chris really well. I mean, Chris did not like the profile. Um, we had some sort of, it was always a little awkward to run into him for a few years, but he, he got over it and um, ultimately, Chris and I, I think, are, are fine. I mean, he, the, the, the scene, the chapter you were reading from, there's a scene at the end where Chris said, um, he said something to the effect. I mean, bottom line, Chris and I are fine. And that's usually Does it really out. matter whether you're fine or not? I mean, it, Michael Hastings ran into where he wasn't fine sure. with a lot of people, but in, if you do your job, does it matter? If you do your job, if you do it honorably, and you serve your, your sources and your readers um, and your bosses and, and the truth, I mean, I don't think you have anything to worry about. You talk a lot about members of Congress and former members of Congress. I mentioned earlier about Chris Dodd. Mm -hmm. I, you're, you're right here. This was a slight hedge compared with what Chris, what Dodd promised when I asked him if he would ever consider becoming a lobbyist. Quote, that I can take off the table right now, said Dodd. One of the many published occasions in which he reiterated his no lobbying vow. We see this a lot. Repeatedly. Yeah. Why? <sighs> I don't know, but I mean, it, it's it's a pretty common reflex. You you see, I mean, I guess when you're in office, it is considered unseemly to say that you are looking for your next job or your lobbying job or your high-priced consulting job. And then once you're out of office, it's as if the etch-a-sketch is clean to, to sort of deploy a Eric Fernstrom trade, uh, term. But so, I mean, look, people are free to make a living. I mean, they are free to, to do this whether they say they were going to or not. I mean, there's no penalty for lying. They're not going to be fined for it. But I, I guess I wrote this, and it's part of a much larger chapter on formers doing just that, because it wears you down. It wears, it makes people, frankly, like me, cynical. Um, and you have these idealistic change machines like the Obama 2008 campaign that says, and look, I mean, very successful campaign. I mean, hope and change, very, very powerful, delivered very, very deftly by the then senator. They said they were not going to take, they, they were not going to opt out of the campaign finance system in 2008. Then when they started raising all kinds of money, they opted out. They said they were not going to work with super PACs in this campaign. Then all of a sudden when they were getting outgunned seriously, they said, you know, we're going to work with super PACs. They said we're not going to have lobbyists in the White House. Then they said, yeah, but we're going to make this exception and this exception and this exception and this exception. We're not going to, I mean, th there's just any number of never minds that you know, this administration, any number of former senators, will just sort of exercise like your recurring get out of free card, get out of jail free card, and it wears you down. And I say that as a journalist, but also as someone who would like to think better of people when they say they're going to do certain things. What did you think of government when you were at the University of Michigan? Civics, government. <sighs> um, well, I certainly didn't study it. Um, I didn't. I mean, I've always had a very um, I, I guess, at least growing up, I had a pretty old-fashioned respect for institutions. I mean, I remember when I was um, in, in Ann Arbor, and I think the, the one election I was there for was the 84 election between Mondale and, uh, and Reagan. And I remember Vice President Bush, then Vice President Bush, spoke at the steps of the Michigan Union on the anniversary of, um, uh, I guess it was the Peace Corps was announced there by, by John F. Kennedy. And I don't remember what year it was. It was maybe 80 maybe 84, 83, around there. And I remember him being heckled. And I remember being just completely appalled that anyone in that office would be heckled. I mean, whether it's a Democrat or Republican. So, I, I mean, I guess I, I remember, I was not politically active at all, but I just remembered being struck by the level of passion and emotion and, and frankly, rudeness that could prevail in, in an environment like a, you know, a, a politically active campus. Representative David Obey, the cantankerous liberal appropriator from Wisconsin, retired in 2010 and, to the shock of many, joined the lobbying shop run by former colleague Richard Gephardt, the former Democratic majority leader whose willingness to reverse long-held positions in service of paying clients was egregious even by D.C. standards of hired gun opportunism. Uh, tell us about Richard Gephardt. Richard Gephardt um, is someone who, again, as an elected official, as a, as a congressman, as a presidential candidate, one of the most passionate, one of the more 
seemingly sincere people you would ever see. I mean, I remember one of my favorite political events ever was seeing him on the eve of the Iowa caucuses in 2004 at a Teamsters rally in Marshalltown, Iowa, which was, you had these huge trucks coming in. You had Gephardt in his um, windbreaker, and he's the son of a milkman driver, and it was just a really, I mean, he got clobbered in Iowa, but it was a really, really, I thought, a great labor rally. And, and then, as soon as he got out of office, he represented any number of corporate interests that had, I would say, spotty records um, in labor relations. He reversed a number of, of positions. I mean, Richard Gephardt has become, you know, I, I think seen by many as an epitome of someone who um, has sort of checked whatever ideals he had at the door once he left Congress in the purposes of doing well after. You say by 2010, Gephardt Government Affairs was listing his annual buildings at 6.5 million, up from a pittance of 625,000 in 2007, in addition to having a top door roster of corporate clients that included Goldman Sachs, 200,000, the Boeing Company, 440,000, Visa, 200,000. Uh, Gephardt became a labor consultant for Spirit Aero, Aero Systems, where he oversaw a tough anti-union campaign. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to talk about how pro-union he was in Congress. Right. <clears throat> what, you, you use the word, the C word, cynical. Mm -hmm. We're told so often not to be cynical, but just to be skeptical. When do you, when do you walk over that line? When you see this, when you see it happening so regularly. I mean, again, it's sort of this reflex in Washington where it is seen as acceptable to, to do this. And again, people can make a living. I mean, I, don't, I can't make this distinction enough. People can do what they want. But this is supposedly a city built on public service, right? Um, and maybe this is quaint and maybe this is outdated of me, but the notion or, or, or the idea that self-service has really taken over this city, I think, to a degree that has become offensive to people inside and outside is a story that I don't think has been fully told. And this is one of the themes that I tried to, to, to flesh out here. Before we finish, can think about uh, if there are people that you would nominate for being on the other side of this. In other words, people, members of Congress or public officials who you think you're not cynical about. But before we do that, Evan Bayh, mm -hmm. uh, you write about. You say that uh, was in dire need of a recovery summer. Mm -hmm. He was worn out, down and burned out in announcing his retirement from the Senate earlier in 2010. The Indiana Democrat was extravagant in his grief over what Washington had become. What happened to Evan Bayh? Uh, Evan Bayh, I mean, he was a former governor, former senator from Indiana. He uh, was very ostentatious on the way out. He, he wrote a op-ed for the New York Times about just how awful it had become, how he wanted to make a difference, how he was just burned out on all of it, and he talked about partisanship and, and everything. And, and, you know, Evan Bayh then, I mean, he, he immediately sort of joined I mean, the Chamber of Commerce. He got a pundit's gig on Fox. He joined all these boards. Um, he did pretty much every, and he also, he talked in that op-ed about becoming a teacher and making a difference in kids' lives. I don't know if he ever got around to that. But ultimately, yeah, I mean, Evan Bayh was another example of, of a whole string of examples of both parties that um, I talk about. When you talked about Trent Lott, and we mentioned earlier uh, uh, the fact that he said he hated Washington, uh, you say this on, on uh, page 170, actually Lott was a little shifty when he abruptly quit the Senate not long after his Republican colleagues made him their whip. Why was he a little shifty. He, he was asked if the timing of his resignation, which actually took a lot of people by surprise because people thought that he was actually going to make a comeback all the way back to, to Republican leader. Um, all of a sudden, he quits. He joins John Bro, his former, former colleague, in a, in a lobbying firm. And a rule was going into effect in which there was a lobbying ban. I think it went from one year to two years. I mean, there was, I, I actually don't have, I don't, it, essentially, it was a timing issue, and it looked a little cute at the time, and it was pretty widely remarked upon. Tammy Haddad, I want to show you some video from 1984, before you even came oh, to Washington. Wow. This is the Larry King Show, radio only. We were simulcasting it over in Arlington, and you'll see a couple people in the, in the picture, including Ron Nesson, who at that time was with Mutual Broadcasting, but mm -hmm. Tammy Haddad. Yeah. This is Larry King in Washington, serving America for 50 years. This is the Mutual Radio Network. Just one vote. Hi, this is Barry Manilow. I've written a lot.
Hey Ron. Well, you have to answer it. Seven six. I know that. Great call. It seems we just All right. Uh, you want Brody at the top, right? At the top. Yeah, yes. The top, and I'm going to go to Falls with. Uh, we're going to go into delay, right? Yes, we are going into delay. Yeah, you're going to get a lot of people in here now. What happened to Tammy Haddad? Tammy, I mean, first of all, what was striking about that is she doesn't have, like, the white streak in the middle of her hair, which is sort of her trademark now. Um, Tammy is a longtime producer for Larry King. Um, she's a real dynamo. I mean, she is a force of nature. She's widely described as that. Uh, she worked for Chris Matthews for a while. Afterwards, I mean, she and Chris parted company, and I think around 2008. Tammy sort of reinvented herself as sort of an, a full-purpose convener of the Washington A-list. She hosts parties. She does a lot of consulting for media companies in which it's not entirely clear what she does, but she seems to have a video component. She produces things, and frankly, she's everywhere. And uh, Tammy is sort of, uh, again, someone who's made Washington work for her and, and has become, you know, she would say that she's a, a, an insider. She just likes to bring people together, and, and frankly, she's been a very successful businesswoman. Have you heard from her and how you portrayed her in this book? I have not heard from her. Um, I, I portray her, I think, accurately. I mean, obviously, everyone is uh, entitled to their own story about themselves, and often I'll write a different one. But no, I, I haven't heard from Tammy. Kurt Bardella, you, the chapter here was uh, adapted for the New York Times Magazine right. a couple of uh, weeks ago. Right. Uh, what's the message? Who is he? Kurt Bardella was the former press secretary to Daryl Issa, who, uh, when I found Kurt, Issa was about to you know, be the, the chairman of the House Government Oversight Committee, and, or Government Reform Committee. And Kurt was this incredibly transparent operator, someone whose ambitions he wore on his sleeve. He joined the workforce at age 17, he didn't go to college, and he was this, I thought, wonderfully, almost refreshing, but also just a, kind of a naked operator. And for some reason he let me follow him around, and I, wa I was interested in him as a, as a subject in the book. And in the course of our dealings together, Kurt forwarded me a bunch of emails that he was receiving on a day-to-day basis to try to give me a fuller picture of how he was spending his days. Um, it was a little unusual. Politico got wind of it. They wrote a story. It became a scandal um, that, that he was sharing emails that he didn't, but people, from people who didn't know their emails were being shared. And um, he was eventually fired and eventually rehired. And, it all happened within a few months, and so I had this beginning-to-end uh, story. Why was he rehired by uh, Daryl Issa? I mean, I mean, I mean, was he fired because he became the issue, and then? Yeah, I think he was fired because he he messed up. I mean, I think he he, I mean, the boss. You know, it was a, it was. I think at the time it was decided that it was time to go. But I think he was rehired because first of all, he has a very very close relationship with Daryl Issa. Uh, I think he was also very good at his job. I mean, Daryl Issa got a ton of press, um, largely thanks to Kurt Bardella. Now, Kurt doesn't work with the press now, but he has some talents, and I think if he's watched closely, he can be very effective. Here's some video of the majority leader in the United States Senate. You write a lot about Harry Reid. Let's watch this little incident right. just recently. We have 15 nominees who have been held up for an average of nine months. Does the place need to be changed? Yes. You always get through to me. What do you do to me? Look at all these people. Always you're here. I don't mind your being here, but you get the questions. You're a bully. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on, on the question of, uh, you mentioned judges. What does that say about Harry Reid? Harry Reid is, I, I think, a, a real character. I, I focused on him. Um, first of all, he, he doesn't have a, a very, very well to find verbal filter, filtering device. He, he says what's on his mind, and uh, he's an odd character, and he's also someone who I think is just fascinating in that he sort of outsourced the, the things that a lot of senators care about, being on TV, getting credit, um, just sort of the big show horse speeches. Um, he'll sort of relinquish that, being on Sunday shows, just so long as he gets to be in charge. I mean, Harry Reid is sort of 
decided to put all charisma on hold and just be the guy who was in charge. Uh, he's quirky as all heck. Let me read a quote. This actually was published in uh, a review in the Wall Street Journal by Andrew Ferguson, but it uh, gets to your point. This is a quote from Harry Reid on the floor, I believe on the floor of the Senate. Yeah. Uh, he is one of the people who has meant so much to me, Reid said of John Kerry, belying the scorn he had expressed to others for the lanky Bay Stater over many years. Reid had observed privately to colleagues that Kerry had no friends. No matter, quote, so I say to John Kerry, Reid concluded, I love you, John Kerry, and you say that he tells lots of people how much he loves them. He does. I mean, look, I mean, Harry Reid is a politician. He has been described as ruthless, Machiavellian, but he's very, very effective. Um, what was interesting to me about Reid is just not so much his cynicism, but, but again, how oddly honest he is. I mean, you just read an example of him, what would seem to be dishonest. But I remember sitting with him on the night he became majority leader in 2006, and he was with Schumer, and they were watching the election returns. And what you were referring to is he was on the phone with every Democrat who won that night. <clears throat> would have these 20-second conversations, and he would punctuate. Excuse me. He would punctuate all of them with some variation on "I love you," "I love you, Hillary," "I love you, Claire," "I love you, Sherrod," "I love you, whoever won that night." And he looked at me at one point and he said. They need to hear that. And it was a knowing, they need to hear that. And I think what he meant was, I mean, they're politicians. I mean, I don't think he was meaning it like, like I, it wasn't so much of a wink, but it was just a matter of fact, Harry Reid statement. And even though, I mean, him telling John Kerry he loves him on the floor of the Senate on the day that John Kerry announced he wasn't running for president again in 2000, I guess it was six, he just said it. It felt right. John Kerry seemed to appreciate it. It was public and they both went on with their business. All right, do you have any, can you list five people in this town uh, that uh, you would, if you did the opposite, a book that probably no one would read, where you would say that member of Congress, that senator, that official in the government uh, is the antithesis? Because I know some people are saying, and there was a tweet I read from somebody in Politico right. saying, what about the hardworking, serious sure. journalists in town? No, I, look, this is, I would make the general point that this is not black and white. A lot of the people in this book, I mean, everyone is complicated, right? People's motives are complicated. A lot of them change over time when you get here. I don't separate myself from this world either. I mean, I think by living here, by operating in the system, by being attached to a major news organization in which people talk to me, probably not because I'm such a charming guy, but because they think it can it can benefit them for some reason or not benefit from them for some reason. You, you do sort of, you sort of see this as a game, but ultimately these are people. And I, again, a lot of this exists in grays, and this sounds like I'm ducking the question. I mean, there are a lot of people who are in it for the right reasons. I think a lot of the people in the book are in it for the right reasons, or at least started that way, or want to think that they are. And ultimately, it's a spinning stew. It's, it's humanity, and it's exaggerated. Andrew Ferguson writes in his review, uh, which is both positive and negative uh, about this, no, Washington is unique because its human pageant is played out entirely on someone else's dime. Mr. Leibovich is uh, the first professional observer to notice that why isn't, is, well, no, I'm, isn't the first professional observer to notice that Washington's economy is from top to bottom parasitic. But he is one of the first not to be especially bothered by it. And someone else said to me, what's his solution to all this? Is there a need for a solution? And why aren't you more bothered by it? I, I First of all, I am bothered by it. I was bothered enough to write a whole book about it. Um, I'm fully aware that this is subsidized by taxpayers. Um, public trust, but whatever you want to say. But look, I mean, I'm not in the solutions game. <laughs> I'm not in the answers game. I mean, there, there is not a chapter at the end where I say, what should we do? Um, and I just, that's not my book to write. I'm a, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm an observer. I'm trying to hold a mirror to this world, hopefully in a way that, that will help people outside of this world understand it. And if it brings about prescriptions, fantastic. Married to a doctor, mm -hmm. what kind? Family practice doctor. Um, Mary is, uh, we've been married a long time, I guess um, almost 20 years, and she works with the poor in Northeast DC in a free clinic. Uh, she is not involved in politics, not particularly engaged in 
the political media world, which I think is a great thing. Three kids. Yeah. How old? Twelve, nine, and six. All girls. Uh, love them to death. Front of your book, this town um, has a picture of a human being here, and cut off at the face. Who is it? It's a great question. A lot of people have asked. Um, I, I guess the, the, the true answer is that some the, the art director at the publisher pulled it off stock photo, some stock photo collection on the internet. So there's your answer. Mark Leibovich, we are out of time. Thank you very much. The book is This Town, Two Parties and a Funeral. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Brian. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.